Well, good morning, Riverside Church. We're so glad that you're here this morning, whether you're here in person or you're worshiping with us online. Would you stand with us here in the room? We're gonna worship together today.
behold the Father's heart, the mystery lavishes on us as D cries out to D. Now desperately he wants us The things of earth stand next to him Like a candle to the sun Unfailing Father What compares to his great love Salvation in His blood, Jesus Messiah, the righteous died for love. He was it all.
said good riddance. Some were sorrowful. Some scattered. But it wasn't over. And I wonder if those disciples who had been with him that whole time went back into their minds to when Jesus took them to the upper room. And they sat at the table and he brought out bread and brought out wine. And he said, take this bread. Eat of it. This is my body given for you. And I wonder if they remembered at that time. He said, this is the wine and this is my blood shed for you.
Jesus wants us to remember what he went through on the cross. That's grace. Covering our sin, covering our shame. Yet he also wants us to remember the hope that was on the third day when he rose. He said, one day you will eat with me in paradise once again. So today, you received a cup. And it's just not a plastic cup filled with some warm juice and a styrofoam cracker. You see, it means something. It now holds value. It holds meaning to you because of what it represents. And so this morning, I want us to partake of that together. So go ahead, if you would, you can remove the the packet, uh, the top, and take out the bread. And as Jesus told his disciples, this is my body, broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Drink of it. I pray this morning that this will be a moment that you will not forget. And every time you take of that communion again, that you will picture Jesus there on the cross and remember what he did for you. But don't forget the hope that came on the third day. Now you'll see on the sides here, there's two, there's a chair on each side. And there are people in your lives and people that you have been praying for that don't yet know what that meaning of that little cup with the styrofoam cracker on top means. But boy, don't you want them to? Don't you want them to know what that means and to be able to share that? Not only the remembrance of Christ, but the hope of Christ. And so I want us just to take a moment and pray. There's names at the bottom of these chairs because there's room at God's table for everybody. So maybe you've put one of those names up there. Maybe you have somebody that's come to mind that needs to be written down and put up there. Before you leave today, make sure you do that so we can pray alongside. So I want you just to take a moment and if you have friends who who need to know Jesus or friends that you've been praying for, let's just pray together as a congregation. Feel free to pray out loud. God hears the, the prayers of his people. So let's just take a minute and let's just pray. God, we thank you. We pray, Jesus.
all God's people said, amen. Well, do me a favor and turn around and greet somebody around you. Good morning, church. How y'all doing? Yeah, awesome. Y'all can do a little bit better. Come on. Good morning, church. How y'all doing? All right. That's better. Thank you. I knew somebody had coffee this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, welcome to Riverside. We're glad that you guys chose to come out and spend your weekend here and worship with us and listen to the word. Um, If you call this place home, we want to say welcome back. If this is your first time, we want to say welcome home. We hope that this place feels like home quickly. Um, I hope that you guys got a chance to stop by our first-time guest area. It's in the lobby on your left on the way out. If you didn't, we have a gift for you. We'd love to meet you. I think Gabby and Matt are there this morning, and they'd love to kind of get to shake a hand, slap a high five, fist bump, whatever you guys are doing, and uh, get you guys connected. Uh, at Riverside, we have a couple ways that uh, we give here, if you guys do call this home. Some of those are on the screen. There's also some boxes in the back um, in the lobby as you guys go out, if you guys want to drop stuff in there. But I want to tell you a little bit of why, um, what we do with the giving, um, what your giving goes towards. And so what a cool day to do that, because we have uh, two of our newest uh, mission partners here at Riverside that I want to introduce you guys to. This is Kevin and Jenny. I want to introduce you to them. I actually met Kevin on our new disc golf course about six months ago. I was out with my family just playing some disc golf, and I ran into him. And I just knew, I remember after talking to you, I just kind of felt like, man, this is not the end. You know, I think, I think this is going to be a friendship. And they uh, came to our church, dove right in. And so I want you guys to get to meet them today because they are actually flying back to Belgium Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. So, Kevin, could you tell us a little bit, introduce your family. Your kids aren't here. They're in the kids' men. But introduce them. And then tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Well, first of all, Matt, I, I just want to thank you for your friendship just like, that was a godly meeting we had there back in the disc golf course back in the day. But just opening the, the church to us, you know, just welcoming us in and really making this a place that we can call home. It's, it's incredible. Um, but we are leaving, you know, and, you know, I just need to introduce you to this lovely lady here on my right. This is my wife, Jenny. And we have two lovely children also in the playground and the children's area, Yoa and Ella. And we are getting on a plane to Belgium. I don't know if you guys know much about Belgium, but this is our country's flag, and we're playing in the Euros today, so prayers up. (laughs) Um, But Belgium um, is a country that I was born and raised in. I have a great pride in my country. But the thing is, Belgium is a country at this moment that only 1% of all the population confess that they have a personal relationship with Christ. A lot of people have a Catholic background, you know, but they're past that. So that is why it is so important for us to go back. You know, the way that we do that is we use sport and play as a platform to bring the gospel to young people. We use that as a way to connect and build relationships with churches and help them to do outreach in their community. It is so needed. And, you know, to be standing up here and just confess to you that I am a product of that ministry. Sport Quest came to my town in 2003 and because of them I am a believer in Christ it is incredible and I'm just now thank you it doesn't stop there because the work is still to be done you know these seats represent my nation as well so thank you so much for your support your love your prayers help us out thank you so much awesome so what I want to do, I want to just kind of pray with them. If you guys can, there's no magic in it, but I'd love for you guys to reach out your hand and just uh, pray over them as we get to kind of send them uh, off uh, back overseas to do uh, some vital work. Jesus, thank you uh, for Kevin. Thank you for Jenny. Thank you for their family. God, thank you for the call on their life. God, we pray uh, for safe travels first to get back uh, to Belgium. And God, I know that they are running right into uh, hitting the ground running and uh, running camps for kids. We, God, we pray uh, for tons of influence, God, tons of Holy Spirit, and uh, pray that these kids um, would come to know you and that their lives would be changed forever, uh, just like you used those camps to change Kevin's life. God, I'm thankful uh, for the six months that we got to connect and uh, do ministry and hang out and get to know them, and God, I pray um, that that would continue uh, even across the ocean. God, we love you, and we thank you for this family. Amen. 
Thank you, guys. You guys uh, watch the rest of the announcements on the screen. Good morning, Riverside. We're so thankful that you've chosen to spend part of your weekend with us. My name's Peter Dahlin. I'm the group's pastor here at Riverside, and we're excited to worship together. If you want any more information about the things you hear this morning or about the life of the church, you can check out our website or go to our Riverside app. Well, this morning, I wanna just remind us to be in prayer for our fourth through sixth grade students. They're heading out this morning to Word of Life Camp, and we wanna be praying that God will meet with them, that he'll speak and teach and draw them along as disciples of Jesus Christ. Remember to pray also for our leaders, Jeff and JL and, and others that are going, uh, be praying that they'll have the words to speak and it'll be an amazing time for all of them to the glory of God. Check out uh, the social media uh, if you want updates or to follow what's happening on that camp trip. And so you can check out uh, the social media to see that. Steve's coming now to bring a new message series for us. And so here comes Steve. Welcome home. Good to see you today, Riverside. I am really excited. We've got our fourth and fifth grade here. I'm going to have them stand up. And sixth. Thank you, Janet Lynn. Um, stand up, you guys, that are getting ready to head out to camp. When I first became a Christian, I got involved in student ministry. And one of the very first things we ever did is our youth pastor had me serve as a counselor at camp with this exact age group. And this was the beginning of so much change and so much fun in my life. So I want to pray for them. we got several things to pray for, so let's do that. And then I've got a friend that I'm going to come up. And, and keep in mind the people that are finding people in Miami right now. Um, we'll, we'll pray for all that this morning. God, thank you so much for these kids. Thank you for the way you call us to trust you as a father. And you teach it to us over and over to come as you like a child, like a young person, recognizing that you are the good father who embraces us, who has a plan for us, to provide for us, to protect us, to grow us into the young men and women that you've called us to be. And Lord, you will be with us always in the midst of that process. And God, we pray that you just bless their time at camp, that the van ride wouldn't give anybody too bad ear aches. And that it would just be a great time to start building excitement over what you're going to do there, that you would give them and the leaders favor. You'd meet them right where they are. We know, Lord, that you do that. But God, I pray that you would just lay foundations and grow the confidence for everybody that's going, that you are the good father, that you know what you're doing, that we can trust you. We thank you for Jesus and ask that you care for our kids, your kids. In Jesus' name, amen. And the leaders, too. That's right. Thank you all. Can I have some high fives? Okay. A friend of mine is going to come up named Jonathan Kaplan. Uh, some of you know Jonathan. Jonathan served as an elder for a number of years. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that. And then any existing elders who are here, come on up. I see at least one this service. And um, you can hold that. Turn it on. But don't talk on it yet. No. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Rocco. The others actually do attend here. They're in first service. Oh, this worked out good. We got like almost half. All right. Jonathan's been an elder for quite a while. He rolled off the board several months ago, but we hadn't gotten a chance yet to, you okay? <laughs> hadn't gotten a chance yet to thank him, to pray for him. And I, um, I'm going to ask him just to share a little bit about his time on the board, maybe a highlight. Yes, thank and you for giving prayer. me an hour to prepare for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you didn't seem to have any trouble first service. You were like, it just flowed. Um, so the highlight for me started with a low light. And when I first rolled on to the board, um, I found myself in an environment with a lot of disunity and a lot of conflict. And I had a personal conversation inside my head with Jesus, like, well, what do you have me here for? And uh, I was very definitive, peacemaker, peacekeeper. Those are the skills that I gave to you. That's what I want you to use here. And so there were a lot of um, difficult times and decisions that we had to make as we transitioned to become a board that is unified. And uh, also resolving conflicts between the elder team and the staff back in those days. So it was long, it was arduous, but um, a lot of cool stuff came out of that because the team that I rolled off of is a lot healthier than the one that I rolled on to. And the highlight for me was being part of the selection process that brought you here to Riverside. So that's my highlight. 
That's a good highlight. I like that. Thanks. Um, Jonathan is an elder, a friend. He's also, he represents highlight and low light for me at one of my lowest points uh, when I've had a hard time as a senior pastor, as a human. He's one of the guys who pressed into my life and showed up and made sure I wasn't alone in it. And I, I deeply value his friendship and I'm grateful that we have a little thing for you. It's a reminder of why we're here, but we'd like to pray for you um, also. We'll pray for the message as we walk into the word and lift up people in Miami as they're going through the collapse of that tower. You guys surround him. Father, thank you so much for, um, for those you call to step into this role to just help guide and protect us as a church. Uh, we know that that can be tiring, that there's a lot of time spent just seeking your, your will, your wisdom, and I'm so grateful for the men that do that, for their friendship. I'm grateful for Jonathan and uh, just the way you use him to continue encouraging that board of elders, that team, and for each of us. And we're just grateful for what you'll continue to do through him as he works and serves here, encouraging leaders, encouraging uh, in the men's ministry, and God, I ask that you give him some rest and, and some joy in the days ahead. And Lord, we lift up those who are suffering in Miami as they're continuing to come to terms with what has happened there. Uh, we pray that more people would be found alive. And we ask, Lord, that you meet people there in the midst of their pain and agony, and you draw them to your goodness. And God, I thank you for your word and the goodness that you teach us in it. And as we open it today to a passage about a guy who went through highlights and lowlights, I pray that you would use that to encourage us, that you meet us in it, that your spirit would guide its teaching and we would hear from you. We thank you for Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, his name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Love you, man. Thank you. Love you too. Yeah, you can keep it now. Give me a hug. Big guy. Thanks. Okay, several years ago, I was in my office at the church where we served in North Dallas, the suburbs of Dallas. And one of our other pastors came in and said, Steve, I need you to meet with this young couple. I'm like, okay. And then he said, well, they're here now. It, it's complicated. <laughs> And so I went out front to greet them and walked them back to the office. And as we got into my office, I learned their names. And as soon as we closed the door, one spoke up and she said, he had an affair. So I had one back to try to make it even. And it made it worse. And then we decided we either need a counselor or we need a church. So we tried a counselor and it didn't help. So right now we were driving past this church and we thought, let's just pull in. And we pulled into the church parking lot, and here we are. <laughs> and then they just stared at me. And I said, oh, would you guys like to talk about Jesus? And they said, yes. And we walked through the gospel. The gospel is the good news. It's the good news that Jesus stepped in to take the weight of our sin and our foolishness and to satisfy its price through his own death, but then rose from the dead and overcame death and offered us forgiveness and eternal life if we admit our sin and receive his offer, which they did. And I thought, that was amazing. I had been praying for God to show me opportunities with people who did not yet know him and then this happened. I was in the right place at the right time and I was so excited about how it was about me. I've been thinking a lot about that story. And we celebrated their new life and that they had this advocate now in their marriage, the Holy Spirit. But as I think about it, I realize that it was very different for them. It was life changing. And they started getting healthier. They got into community. There was a lot of difficult work Ahead, But the day they turned their car into the parking lot where our church was and walked into my office, it was one of the worst days of their lives. Because up until that moment, their worlds were shaking. They were at the 
end of their ropes. They were absolutely falling apart and about to lose hope. They were desperate. And they made one last effort. They'll call on God and see if he can maybe do something. And he came through in exactly the right moment. He guided them to exactly the right place. And he caught them as they were falling. I've thought about that. And how I got to be in the right place at the right time, but it was all because God had set this up to catch them. It was God. They were ready to call out to him, and he had a plan already in place. And when they looked up and they saw our parking lot and they walked into our lobby and they got introduced to me who had also been asking God for opportunities to share the gospel, I was willing and available, but God could have used anybody. He had them ready. He had been preparing to save them. The truth be told, the reason the other pastor came and got me is because he felt inadequate because it was so complicated and they thought I was perfect for the peculiar stuff and was often called in, Steve, this is nuts. Will you take over? <laughs> there are many stories like that in the Bible. Peculiar people who didn't expect it or didn't see it coming. And in God's perfect timing, he shows up at the right place at the right time and he catches them, saves them, and then uses them. You're going to meet several of those people this summer as we walk through these stories. I think you will find it very, very encouraging and helpful. You'll hear from several of our teachers. I'm going to take a little time to rest in the next uh, few weeks and come back with some time to study and just excited about what we'll do at the end of the summer. But I think this is going to be really encouraging and really helpful. The first person we're going to meet is named Elijah. And he's going to show up in the book called 1 Kings in the Old Testament, the old part of your Bible. Your Bible's in these two halves, this half that explains God and what went wrong and the story of his people and then the part where Jesus comes for us to rescue and to restore us to God in the New Testament. Elijah's way back there and we have a book called 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It's not because they're really two different things. It took two different scrolls. They were long. All the books in your Bible that have the, well, not all of them, a couple of them that have the two numbers, it's just two scrolls. That's all it means. To understand what's about to happen, you need to understand the situation. So I'm going to tell you the story, and then we'll explain it as we go on. Good? Elijah lived in Israel. But at that time, Israel was no longer really Israel. It had been split in half in 931 BC, before Jesus. The southern half had stayed more faithful to God and was called Judah. But Elijah lived here in the northern half, which kept the name Israel. And he had a wicked king named Ahab who had a wicked queen named Jezebel. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him, and maybe more than many who were after him. Ahab provoked God. He worshipped Baal, this false god, the god they considered a god over agriculture and rain and fertility. And you can imagine how those things come together. All of that is the bringing of abundance and harvest. Uh, all that tied together is what allows people to thrive and live. So it's all a complicated thing. And the worship of him was obscene. They, part of the way he fertilized the earth was a sexual thing he did in the sky to create this. And it was profoundly uh, obscene to God and to what he had shown his people. And Ahab even built, he built a temple so that everybody could worship this false god. And it was a debased form of worship. There was sexual stuff, there was a sacrifice of infants, and he made an Asherah. An Asherah was one of two things. It's the name of his consort or wife, the uh, god us, they considered. But the actual thing he made was either an image for Asherah, an abominable image, that is an image representing her, or an abominable image of the Asherah, that is an image of the sacred pole, which itself images Asherah. 
That's confusing. It's, even an, it's either an idol of her, Baal's lady, or it's a giant male body part, a phallus, for her. So this is dark. My notes say to make a joke about pole dancing, but I probably should skip that. The whole Old Testament is a story of God saying, trust me. And some do, but many say no. And not only betray that trust, but lead others astray from him. Ahab was the king of God's people. And he led the entire nation away from God's protection and provision. So God is provoked and he speaks to Elijah. And Elijah went to Ahab and told Ahab, there will be no more rain until I say. You got to imagine, this is a time without Publix, without Costco. It's devastating for a country at that time to go in a long period of drought. Famine is going to follow it. And they were worshiping a false god who claimed to be the god of rain. And so when Elijah comes and begins the confrontation, it's not just with this king, it's also with this false god. I'll tell you when it's going to rain again, not him. In the midst of it, God provided water for Elijah. He actually told him where to go. There was a brook, a stream that wouldn't dry up for a while. And in the morning, ravens would bring him bread to eat. And at night, they would bring him meat, which is really cool, right? You imagine you get the ding dong on your little phone doorbell thing. And you go, who is it? Oh, it's some bird in an Uber Eats uniform. <laughs> I, do, I wonder, though, because I think this is amazing. But what exactly was that like? I'm assuming... They stole the bread from somewhere. They took it from people, and he got bread bread. But where'd they get the meat? Is that like roadkill or Hello Fresh? What exactly are the ravens bringing him? But God provides for him, and that lasts until the brook, the little creek, it finally dries up. And then God tells Elijah, I need you to go to this widow in a specific town. And so Elijah went to her. She knows he's a man of God. He's one of the prophets. And he tells her, you need to feed me. And she obeys him, but she's like, I don't have anything left. We just have a handful of flour and a little bit of oil. Honestly, we were about to prepare this. And I was going to, me and my son, we were going to eat it. And they were going to die because there's no food. We have nothing. Nobody has food. Elijah told her, don't fear. Feed me first. <laughs> and she did. And her jar of flour... And her jug of oil never ran out. There was always enough. Every day. It had it in it. It was going to be empty and it wasn't empty. It had flour and oil. But in the midst of it, life's hard. And her son got sick. Even with the prophet there, bad things happen sometimes. And her son gets sick and dies. And so Elijah prays. He prays to God for the life of this boy. And the boy comes back to life. Three years in now to this drought, Elijah goes back to Ahab. God sends him to Ahab, the king, again. And he tells the king, this is your fault, by the way. You provoked this in your worship of this false god. So I need you to gather all your little prophets of your false god. There's 450 of them. And all the little prophets of your wife's false god, your consort's false god, Asherah. There's 400 more of them. And we're going to meet up on the mountain, and we're going to have a challenge. So they meet up on a mountain called Carmel. And Elijah speaks to the people who've gathered, not just the prophets, but part of the nation. And he tells them, you need to choose now between Baal and between the Lord God. And he got crickets. It was nothing. They're just silent. They don't want to make the decision. They're sitting on their hands. So he asks them to allow him a challenge. And he presents it like this. You prophets of Baal, you'll build an altar. I'll do the same thing. We will take two bulls and we will sacrifice them, one each, on our altar. We'll cut them into pieces. We'll place them on the altar. But don't light the fire under the altar. Instead, you get it completely prepared and you will call to your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The one who answers by fire. You hear that? It's like the one who lights the bulls. That one is God. Good? 
Everybody agreed. Oh, this ought to be really good. This is going to be exciting. Ahab had led the entire nation astray. So God was challenging not only Ahab, but Baal directly. You claim to be a God? Let's see. Let's see what happens. You claim to be the God of rain? Don't think so. It will rain when I say it will rain, and right now it's going to stop. And it stopped for three years. You claim to be the God of lightning? Let's find out. So the Baal worshipers went first. And they called out from morning, early in the morning, till noon. And at noon, Elijah began to make fun of them. He began to taunt them. This is in your Bible. It's in the book, 1 Kings chapter 18. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry aloud, for he's a God. you got to be louder. He's way up there. He's a God. Either he's musing, maybe he's thinking, or he's relieving himself. That's in your Bible. Maybe he's in the bathroom, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. You've got to call louder, make some noise so he can hear you. And they began to cut themselves and dance and cry until evening. But there was no sound, no response from their God. That, those words, no sound, no response, when that's used in Hebrew, those are the words that would be used to describe a dead body. He's dead. There's nothing there. It's nothing. And then Elijah said, gather around me now at evening. And he took an ancient altar, an older altar to God that had been torn down, possibly during their reign. We don't know that part. And he repaired it. And then he took 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he built the altar back. And he dug a trench around the whole little pile of stones with a flat top on it. And he called for four full water jugs. Water jugs were tall. This isn't little pitchers. These are jugs of water. This is in a drought, mind you. And they brought him four full water jugs. And he poured them over the altar. And then he did it again and then again. So now there's 12 full jugs of water that have been poured over this thing until the bull is saturated. And the trench around the altar is full of water. And Elisha prayed. Elijah, sorry. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. And that you have turned their hearts back. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the bull, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. You place yourself in that story for a moment. Your king, which that's hard already for some of us. If you grow up in the U.S., the idea of having a king is, is difficult. But he has power. His words are law. Your king has sanctioned the worship of Baal. And your queen, she's been killing the true prophets of God. And they've been hunting Elijah for three years. You can read the rest of the information in the story. They've been looking for him because this is causing a famine. And now there's an assembly, calls everybody up on the mountain, and you just watch the king's people, and you watched Elijah ridicule them. And then with only a prayer, God sends fire from the sky that consumes even the rocks. Have you made a decision about who is God and who is not? It seems like it would be simple when God shows up with fire. You're in the right place at the right time. It seems simple. And the, cry, the crowd cries out, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah commands the crowd to seize these false prophets. I don't know if that's 450 or 850. If it's all of them, they take them off the hillside into the valley and they slaughter them all. According to the law given in Exodus for any who lead this way, this is what was to be done. And then Elijah turns to Ahab and says, go eat and drink for there's the sound of rain. And so Ahab prepares to do that. And Elijah climbs back up the hill onto the top where you could overlook the ocean. And he prayed and he sent his servant, go look over the sea. Do you see anything? And the servant said, no. And then Elijah prayed again. 
Do you see anything? No. And he did it again, again. And finally, on the seventh time, he said, do you see anything? And the servant says, yes, there's a cloud forming. <laughs> it's a great moment and just to pause and think about prayer. Elijah just asked God to send fire from the sky, and God did. Now he prays, and nothing happens. And then he prays again and again. How many times did he pray? Seven. That's Elijah. How many times do you pray before you give up? It's convicting, isn't it? Soon, a great rain begins. That cloud forms quickly. Ahab now heads back to his palace in Jezreel, the city, in his chariot. And this is in there. Elijah pulls his cloak up between his legs. He girds his loins so that he can run freely. And he outran the chariot back to the city. Let's take stock, okay? So far, just place yourself in this. What, what would you assume would be your state of mind at this point. So far, Elijah, Elijah prophesies a drought, and it starts right then. It's going to last three years. God feeds Elijah by ravens. They show up with food twice a day, every day. Then God feeds Elijah with an unending flour jar and thing of oil. And then Elijah prays, and a boy rises from the dead. He's resurrected. And then Elijah asks for fire from heaven, and God sends it. And then Elijah prays for rain, and he watches the cloud form. And then Elijah outruns a chariot. You with me? This is Elijah. So now we start in chapter 19. Now I got to warn you, this next part is hard. Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done. He has to inform the queen, right? Got to catch her up. And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And I assume somewhere in there also told her that he let him go. Uh, I don't know if Ahab is afraid, if he's impressed. We don't know. We do know that Jezebel was not impressed. We also know she was the daughter of a priest king of Baal in a place called Tyre and Sidon, two places. And her marriage had been arranged by Ahab's daddy to create an alliance and give them strength against another country. So it would unite these nations if he married her, and that would help set them up to resist Damascus. She is why Israel turned to Baal. That's in there. It's down in chapter 21. She was the influence that did this because he's trying to appease these nations so that he can be strong and have peace. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She's talking about the prophets. In other words, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. Sends word to him. If you had this moment, Maybe not a queen putting a bounty on your head, I hope not, but you're on top of the world. Everything's working. You, you, whether that's you see success in your efforts at school or your success and efforts at work or you're just walking with God and you're seeing his hand and you're, he's answering prayer and you're like, this is what we prayed for, this is amazing. And then something goes wrong or bad news comes. This is Elijah she's threatening. He had just had all her prophets killed with one order. God answers his prayer with visible movement in the sky. He prays and they watch fire come out of the, they watch the rain clouds come right then. That's incredible. Then he was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judas, and left his servant there. It belongs to Judah, so he goes into the southern kingdom. He crosses the border. It's 100 miles, 100-mile journey, about 160 kilometers. Elijah fled in fear. He's afraid. Now, what do you think that felt like? At what point, just place yourself, he's a human. At what point is he second-guessing what he's doing? At what point does he start to think, not only did he fail, but now he failed again. He's running out. And 
in the desert? At what point did he become ashamed or humiliated? But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. It's a type of tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Despite the evidence, he sees himself as a failure. You ever do that? It doesn't matter how strong the evidence is, you still see yourself through this twisted lens. I don't know exactly what's going on with Elijah, but as a person who has struggled with depression and anxiety, this looks a lot like it. I don't know. You have to be careful of putting a modern diagnosis on ancient people and the way scripture tells the story, but it's like, wow. Whatever it was, Elijah went from bold enough to single-handedly challenge several hundred false prophets to a God battle and then kill them to huddled under a tree in the wilderness asking God to take his life. He crumbled. He fell apart. Elijah broke down. He crashed. He broke. And maybe you've crumbled. Maybe you've failed. Maybe you've blown the interview or been attacked or lost hope or crashed or got trolled or ghosted or canceled. Maybe you ran away. Maybe you were broken. What's God do when his people break, break down? I want to try to answer that by looking at what God did do. What did God do when Elijah broke down? Because Elijah was his guy. We'll prove that as we go through the story. And Elijah broke down. And what happened next is what I believe to be one of the most encouraging and God-revealing passages in the whole Bible. You want to see it? Okay, chapter 19, verse 5. He lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold... An angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Wow, right? Angel touched him. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. An angel fed him. Apparently, the angel cooked for him there on the hot stones and then let him rest. God is still providing for Elijah. He had done it with the ravens. He did it with the jar of flour. And now he's doing it with the hand of an angel. We keep going. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. The word angel in Hebrew is malak. It means messenger, a messenger of God. And there are several in the Bible. There's a couple who are named, and we meet them. But this one isn't one of the named ones. It's different. It's a specific one. It's the angel of the Lord. This one is unusual in the Bible. If you read through, you learn about Gabriel and Michael. They show up a few places. Other people have traditions that inform, but I think I don't trust all those. Here's what we got in Scripture. We get a couple of named ones, and then we get this one. And this one's not like the other angels. It's different. Angel of the Lord. He appears to Samson's mom. We're going to talk about Samson in a few weeks. When Samson's mom sees him, he doesn't, she doesn't recognize him, which is unusual. Most of the time that angels show up, people are terrified. They know exactly what's in front of them. She doesn't recognize him at first. He'll show up with Hagar out in the wilderness. Can talk about her too. She's out there, and the angel of the Lord speaks from the first person. The angel, instead of saying, God says, the angel says, I will multiply your offspring, make your offspring into a great nation. <clears throat> and then when Hagar speaks back to him, she addresses him as God, which is weird. Angel of the Lord shows up when Abraham is about to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is the angel of the Lord who stops him and says, you have not withheld your son from me, me, it's like standing in for God, that's weird. When Moses sees the burning bush, the angel of the Lord speaks to him from the bush. Whenever the angel of the Lord 
appears in the Bible. He's in some kind of human-ish form. We know that because he's cooked the bread cakes somehow. He's made this thing. He has hands, I guess. <laughs> and he speaks like he is God. I and a number of other Christians, and maybe some of you, believe that the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Jesus didn't begin when he was born of Mary. Jesus is eternal. He was always there. God, with God in the beginning. At birth, he just became man. He always was present. It makes sense that he would appear now and then in the Old Testament. It explains how Moses can see God face to face and not die. He's looking to Christ. You hear this? What did God do when Elijah broke down? An angel touched him, fed him, let him rest. I believe it wasn't just an angel. I think it was Jesus. Jesus showed up and touched him, appears to him. I don't know, do you tap him on the shoulder? Or how does Jesus wake you up? Is it a nudge or arm? Can you imagine that moment? Just place yourself there. The bottom has fall out, fallen out. All your worst fears have come true. You fall asleep alone out in the wilderness, sure that there's no hope left, whether that's a literal wilderness or a figurative wilderness. Things are just coming apart in your life. And as you're there asleep, something touches you and it wakes you and you rub your eyes and you try to scrape the crust out. And that reminds you of how you got there. And it all comes flooding back. And as your eyes start to focus in the midst of that moment, it, it, it's Jesus. When things got tough for you, when you got overwhelmed, or you started to despair, was Jesus there? Because he was for Elijah. And when I read the Bible, Jesus is really clear about this from the moment that he first tells the apostles what to do as the church. When he's got them up on the hill, after he's come back to life, he has them there and he tells them, I want you to go make disciples of all nations. Teach them to follow me baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's where he told us. In that moment, he promised he would be with us. I can assume that means that whenever you faced whatever it is you're facing or whatever you did face, he's there, just like with Elijah. And then Jesus fed him baked a bread cake on hot stones and brought water to him, touched him and told him, eat. And then he gave him rest. He let him sleep. He does one thing all day long, eat this. And then he slept. We do this thing in our small groups when we do our training. And if you've been in a Riverside group, you've probably walked through some guidelines at the beginning. And one of them is to help teach the group that when somebody is in the middle of sharing, whether that's struggle or pain, don't try to Fix it right then. Let them share. Let, let time happen for the Holy Spirit to work in that. Let them tell the whole story. If you relate to what they're going through or you have some wisdom, then connect and talk and share that later. But in that moment, don't fix it. It's not your job. Jesus finds Elijah, or at least not your job in that moment. It's probably never your job to fix it. It's his job to fix it. And when he finds Elijah in the wilderness, praying for death, he doesn't fix it, not yet. He just feeds him, gave him rest, touched him. Those are things he does for a lot of people. When he was walking as a human, he let people come touch him. He touched people all over the New Testament. He promises to be present with his people. You who have chosen him promises that. And he promises that he is the bread of life. He is living water. He will nourish us. And he calls all who are weary and heavy laden to come to him and he will give you rest. I'm not a counselor. But when your friend crumbles, these things Jesus did are a good start. To show up, to feed him, and to let him rest. It's a good start. Moreover, I am confident that he himself will do these things for you. I feel like I've talked about my own uh, 
of struggles enough. Sometimes it gets embarrassing, but that's a lie, right? I, I wonder if Elijah believed that, if there was ever a moment where Elijah was with God and said, God, please don't write down my whole story. I'm embarrassed. I hope not. I hope he wasn't embarrassed because his story is where my story found hope. At the end of 2017, I resigned as a senior pastor. It was the right thing to do. It was what the church where we were needed. They needed a different guy for the season they were in. It was what I needed too. But in that moment, it sure felt like I was failing. And it was terrifying. I wanted to go hide under the broom tree. And the truth is, part of why I got to that place is because I did fail. I was a brand new senior pastor. I didn't correctly understand the problems. I didn't know how to get help. I didn't know how to lead through it, and I didn't recognize that I wasn't the right guy. And more truth, in the midst of that, my depression was mixed in, in the, at the beginning. I didn't get depressed after I stepped down. I was depressed, and then I stepped down. And I finally had gotten to a place where I just let Jesus take control and was willing to do the things that scared me the most and to step away. And in the midst of that, Jesus showed up. He fed me. It felt like it. He nourished me, gave me strength, gave me courage, and he gave me rest. That was the first time I had stepped away from ministry in 24 years since I began at camp with those little kids. It had been 24 and more, more since I did it as a volunteer. And I'm not saying that depression is that simple. I had to get direct help for that too. I had to have counseling, had to have medicine. I still do. And exercise, which I don't, and <laughs> prayer. And some simple little tasks. It started that year for me in the garage. I started making those little crosses. Those were about therapy for me. I didn't know that when it started, but I would do this repetitive task over and over and over. It's like, I can handle this. I can do this. I was excited about doing it. I'd get up in the morning. I wouldn't sleep all day. I'd get up, and as soon as I could get up, I'd get out in the garage, and I'd start working on this. And then I would work until it was too late to make noise uh, around my neighbors. That was a huge part of recovery for me. I did that for several straight weeks and began to add a few other things with it. Look at what God does with Elijah. He tells him, the journey's too great for you, so there's going to be a journey. And he arose, and he ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Jesus gave him a simple, repetitive task. Eat this, and then you're going to go up, and you're going to walk to that mountain. You're going to walk, and you're going to sleep, and you're going to walk, and you're going to sleep, and you're going to walk, and you're going to sleep. Go from here to there. It took 40 days. It took weeks. Just one task. He gave him a simple task. He took all this off his shoulders. This isn't on you, Elijah. It was me and Baal, not you and Baal. I'm God. You're just my guy. It's not on you. So I'm going to simplify the task. Here's your task. You're going to get up and walk, and you're going to get up and walk. It was simple. And Elijah did it on two little bread cakes made by Jesus. That's some good stuff. There's this moment in the book of John, one of the letters of the New Testament, written through one of the apostles. After the resurrection, Jesus appears to some of his guys, and he cooks breakfast on the shore of the sea there. They get so excited, Peter jumps out of the boat to get to him. If Jesus cooks for you, you need to eat it. It is good stuff. That carried Elijah for 40 days. It also put Elijah in a very special club. I don't know if you know this. There are three people in the Bible who spend 40 days and nights alone in the wilderness. Do you know this? Two of them we've already talked about in this passage. The third one is going to be Moses. That's right. When he gets the Ten Commandments. He's going to be alone in the wilderness with God for 40 days and nights. And then Jesus, when he was being tempted by the devil, tested. And now Elijah, when he fell apart. It's the third one. 800 years later-ish, they have a meeting. You can read about it in Matthew and Mark, two of the other gospels, the, the accounts of Jesus. Peter, James, and John, three of the apostles, disciples, they go up on the mountain with Jesus, alone with him. It's just them and Jesus. And God uh, reveals the glory of Jesus. He, it says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became radiant. And the voice of God spoke and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. We call it the transfiguration. There's a moment where it was obvious who he really was to them. Peter, James, John, and Jesus 
And then there were two extra people that show up. You want to guess who they were? It was the 40-day club. Moses and Elijah appeared there on the mountain talking with Jesus. The apostles, those two guys talking with him, it's Moses and Elijah. They're just there hanging out with Jesus. Elijah was God's guy. He loved him. He loves him. When he fell apart, God shows up, he feeds him, he gives him rest, and then he gives him a simple task. When Elijah arrives now at Mount Horeb, which is the same mountain where God will give Moses the Ten Commandments, he went into the, a cave and waited. And then God spoke to him, and God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He's saying, I failed. I can't fix these people. And I'm alone. And I'm the only one left. You ever been there? You think you're the only one? The devil loves this lie. It's a lie. You look past the evidence, think I'm the only one. You're not the only one. God tells Elijah then, go stand out on the mountain. Elijah doesn't do it. And then a mighty wind passed over the mountain, tore the mountain. It broke apart the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake that shook the mountain. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake, a fire passed across the mountain, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle whisper. What do you think was going to happen? What do you think Elijah thought was going to happen? God told him, go outside, but he didn't. Was he afraid to go outside? Did he think, if I go outside, I'm going to have to face God now. I'm going to have to face up for my failure. I'm going to face the fury of the wind and earth and fire that God sends across the mountain. Was he scared? I, I don't know. What do you think? What happened when you're ashamed, when you're alone, when you're afraid? You think God's going to shake you apart like he did the rocks? That is not what he does. It's not. There was a gentle whisper. And now Elijah obeys. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here? Elijah, he just asks. And Elijah gives the same answer he gave a moment ago. I've been jealous for you, but the people have forsaken you, and I'm the only one left. And God responds. The Lord God said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. It's still a simple task. What God doesn't say is go face your accuser, you coward. He doesn't. As a matter of fact, he's not even going to go back the same way. He's going to go back into the wilderness of Damascus, into Syria, and he's going to anoint a new king for Syria. That's going to be an issue for Ahab and Jezebel. That's one of the nations that surround them. It's still a simple task, and he keeps going. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, which is also going to be a problem for Ahab because Ahab's king over Israel. Elijah's going to go and anoint a new king. Ahab definitely won't like that. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehalah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. You're going to anoint a successor for you. There's three guys. This is your task. You're going to go anoint them. Why does he need to anoint a successor? Is that because God's disappointed? Elijah is washed up. He's broken, damaged. We're going to toss him aside. No. I already showed you when Jesus was transfigured centuries later, his glory revealed on the mountain in front of three of his disciples, two humans got to sit in on that day, Moses and Elijah. If you were God and you wanted to honor your servant, what would you do? Let them tag along with Jesus when you're ready to speak from the sky? When they get to see the moment that all history anticipated where Jesus was going to restore us to God. He was going to pay for the weight of sin. He was going to make a way. It's what they had longed for. How will God deliver us from sin? 
They got to sit there at the moment his glory was revealed. God's not disappointed in Elijah. Far from it. If you keep reading, he's got a lot to do still. What he is doing is preparing to protect him. In verse 17, and the one who escapes, he's talking about these men he's going to anoint. The one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. These guys will be Elijah's bodyguards. Them and their entire nations, they're going to kill Ahab and Jezebel. If you want to read ahead, go down into chapter 21, some bonus reading. And you can see how God continues to work through him. He will send Elijah to Ahab one more time, which he can do because God is going to restore his strength. He gave him a safety plan. He really did. He's put, hey, Hazael's going to protect you. He's going to bring the sword. If he misses any, Jehu will kill him. And any he misses, Elisha will take care of him. When Ahab provoked God and Elijah crumbled under it, and God says, I'm going to take care of my guy, Elijah. He's going to take care of his person. Gave him a safety plan. We do this for people who lose hope now. I assume we learn it from God. People who are in danger of taking their own life or hurting themselves. We don't assign warriors with swords, but we certainly put warriors around them. People who will surround you to keep you safe, to fight for you, sometimes to protect you from yourself. Sometimes you have to go to the hospital for that because we can't do enough until we can control the rooms. There's no way for you to hurt yourself there. But it's this plan that God sets up way back here with Elijah. That's his plan. If you read chapter 21, Elijah tells Ahab when he does go back to him, Ahab, by the way, I think you should know that um, dogs are gonna lick up your blood from the ground. <laughs> and by the way, dogs are gonna eat your nasty wife Jezebel, which is what happens. You read it. Eventually, she's thrown from the wall of the city and the dogs devour her body on the ground. And he's not alone. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. He's got 7,000 who have been faithful through all of this. So at this moment, God tells him, by the way, son, you're not alone. You were never alone. God shows this to Elijah. We find out if we read it, there was another prophet there who'd actually been hiding prophets in some of the cage, or caves to protect them. God shows Elijah he's not alone. Not only will these three men protect him, but now Elisha, his successor, will become a friend, will become his assistant, his apprentice. And there's 7,000 faithful others. I started reading this story about 33 years ago. I had been through some stuff and people pointed to this and explained it and I started to find comfort in the way that God care, cared for Elijah and I began to realize how good a counselor God is. And there's two more things that have always stood out to me in this story that I want to share. The first one is God never rebukes Elijah. Never. You read it, look for it. It's never in there. He doesn't rebuke him for being afraid. He doesn't rebuke him for hiding. He doesn't rebuke him for being discouraged. He doesn't rebuke him for whining. He doesn't even rebuke him for not going out onto the mountain when he told him to. God always acts in the most loving way toward you, and you can see it so easy in Elijah's mess. And the second thing, God usually answers Elijah's prayers in dramatic ways. But there's one prayer at the beginning of this story that God absolutely refuses to answer. It was back in verse 4. Elijah asked that he might die. And he even said, oh Lord, take my life. He asked, he prayed to die. Something in him knew, and rightly so, that his life was not his own to take. But he asked God to do it, please. That's where I was 30 thumb years ago, back before I started reading this story, before I had come to know Jesus, asking God to die. That's actually one of the nights that I did come to know Jesus. It is a prayer that God absolutely refuses. Always. All the way through the Bible, since the Garden of Eden, death is defeat. It's judgment. Death is the enemy. It is the product of sin. Life is the gift. And God wills Elijah 
to live. So much so, he never answers this prayer. Do you know this about Elijah? It's one of the other little known facts in the Bible. If you go into the second Kings and the second scroll, uh, we learn more about Elijah. He's dressing in a garment of hair. We get started to get a picture of his personality. There's more fire from the sky. He just snaps and fire, fire. It's not quite like that. You read it, it's dramatic. It's amazing. One day he's walking with Elisha, and as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. He didn't die. He never died. God took him up. Angels come surround them, and God takes him straight up. God's answer to his prayer for death was no and heck no. <laughs> he took him straight in the sky. What's God will? What's God do when his people break down? He wills you to live. That's his will. He loves you. Your life is his to direct. And life is a gift. And Jesus has already promised to show up, to nourish you, to give you rest. And Jesus said his yoke, his teaching, it's easy and his burden is light. It's a simple task. Just follow me. Let me be the guide. Just follow me. Trust me. That's it. And then he calls us to look out for one another. I believe the church is part of God's safety plan for us. Hear me, that may mean your friends have to intercede in ways that are difficult. Sometimes it means that people who love you have to get you to a place that you're safe or to intervene when the addiction is out of control and to get you to a place where you're safe and your brain can work correctly again. And I want you to come to understand that you're not alone. Life is a gift and it's worth fighting for. And there may be moments when it feels like it is all coming apart. Like my friends did that day that they pulled into the church as their last ditch effort to try to save their marriage. We weren't able to save the marriage. They ended up splitting up a few years later. But God saved them. And sometimes it's in the chaos of that mess that he steps in to rebuild you. And he knows the right place and the right time as you trust him. And you can trust him. Can I pray for you? God, thank you for the story of Elijah. For putting out there some of the parts that... Uh, that just show his humanness. I'm grateful that you tell it the way that it was, that you show us what it meant for you to love him and the promise we have that you love us. You've given us Jesus, Lord. You love us like that. You'll care for us like that. A guy that's so tremendously encouraging. You don't rebuke him when he falls apart. You feed him. You give him rest. You touch him. You show up. And God, we just pray for confidence. I'm grateful for places like this in your story where we know that we can have confidence. Thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen. So the mission of Riverside, make and send disciples, disciples which just means students or followers of Jesus who love and live like Jesus. That was never on Elijah's shoulders to lead all the showdown and do these things. That was always God just telling him, do this next step, do this next step. It was on God's shoulders. It's not on you to fix people, to save the people. That's on Jesus. It's just on you to let him lead. Amen? God bless you, church.